Hello and welcome back for another reaction. Geography Now, part two of the United States of America. If you watched part one, I hope you, uh, no, if you watch, if you're watching now. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the brain just says things that is not correct. If you haven't watched part one, I really strongly believe you should do so to get some kind of a context we're going to start with geography now and the united states of america and we're going to dig in on food and that's something that Ricky likes especially american food the diversity is insane i love that if you do enjoy this i want you to smack the like and of course hit that subscribe i would greatly appreciate that and yes i am well aware that i need a haircut my wife tells me, she tells me like two days, two times a day. Yeah. Thank you so much to the Patreons and the channel members. Thank you so much for the amazing support. And a big shout out to the Supreme Tier donators. You guys freaking rock. Personal shout outs to the ultimate supporters, Deja Walt, Roni Dwayne, Tammy, Kevin, Dana, and Troy. Amazing support. Now, let's continue on Geography Now. United States of America. Breakfast. You've seen it. Pancakes, bacon, sausages, eggs, and don't forget those hash browns. However, wow. most Americans will eat another iconic American invention, cereal. That's right. We invented the fastest breakfast on earth. You just add milk and done. Otherwise, we have some very iconic regional cuisines. For one, let's bring it to the Native American side. Such dishes that are shared amongst numerous tribes in the lower 48 include things like fry bread, bison jerky, three sisters stew, wojapi, oh. wild rice. Whereas for the Inuits up north, you might find whale blubber slash meat, Caribou slash reindeer meat and sausage, cloudberry or salmonberry jams, smoked Alaskan salmon, king crab legs, and a gudok, their dessert. Whereas on the islands like Hawaii and Samoa, you'll find many dishes baked in their own versions of the earth oven. Poi or mashed purple taro paste and kakui nut meat is the staple in many dishes. They specialize in numerous garnished seafood dishes like ahi ahi and Pacific lobster. And the immigrants, like the Filipinos, Portuguese, and Japanese, even have incorporated their own fusion to modern day Hawaiian cuisine in things like loco moco, spam musubi, and po Poke bowls. Then we get to soul food, which you've probably heard of. Fried chicken and waffles. Poke balls. Fried okra, macaroni and cheese. Oh, hello. Greens, oh, hammocks. yes. And speaking of the South, our best kept secret, Cajun food. Imagine, if you will, if French cuisine was forced to use ingredients from the swamp and it actually worked. Almost every American grocery store has some kind of Cajun or Creole seasoning. My favorite, chef gone mad. Things like gumbo, jambalaya, crawfish boil, pralines, boudin, beignets, alligator, and andouille sausage. New England alligator. has their own cuisine as well. Things like lobster rolls, lobster bisque, clam chowder, and you can't forget Mary Maryland blue crab and crab cakes. We also have Tex-Mex cuisine, which typically has heavier ingredients and uses more flour tortillas instead of corn. Enchiladas, fajitas, quesadillas, and also we have so many different regional barbecue style. And Barb's favorite, Kansas City style ribs. Love it, so good. So many places have their own style of pizzas and hot dogs. The biggest competitors are Chicago deep dish and New York thin crust. Americans are also known for their sweet pies, most notably apple pie, banana cream, lemon uh -huh. meringue, key lime yeah. pie, pecan yeah. pie, Pie. And speaking uh, of pies, one of our favorites is pumpkin served on Thanksgiving. Never tried pumpkin pie. Never tried. And finally, our most iconic national dish, the burger, which has so many regional specialties, America would be nothing without the burger. Well, that's it. For me. And until we meet again, stay tuned and stay ready. Uh. Thank you, Noah. Quick side note in regards to the food stuff. Yes, we have a tipping culture at sit-down restaurants, not fast food chains. Typically, rates are 15 to 20%, and it's not that hard to calculate. You just take the price that you owe, move the decimal place one spot, and then divide that by two, and then add that half to the move decimal number that you originally priced yourself that you owe. Simple. And yes, what? we no. eat while walking. Like I said, we value our time. We want things now. And see, that's America. Every ethnic group has a story on how they got here, and everyone has their own thing, yet at the end of the day we're all on the same journey of figuring out how we ended up sitting in our cars eating taco bell in a walmart parking lot contemplating life choices at 3 a.m we've all been there anyway that's a charming way to introduce my people to the world let's jump into the demographics i 
I think all Americans, they all want the same thing, live a good life. They just want different versions of that. It's a constant wild chase and the hunt for the next big thing. We may all come from different backgrounds, but we've got each other's backs. That and we can all go to McDonald's at 5 a.m. Opinionated and maybe a little crazy, but in a good way. Bald eagles flying through the air, although those majority live in Canada now. El boricua es orgullo, es pasión. Saber que de un 100 por 35 salen cosas muy grandes. The Americans are the only people on earth who will wear sunglasses after the sun is set. So watch it. You gotta, you gotta watch Top Gun. Mavericks. It's all about the Mavericks, bro. Where we love adventure. We love unpredictability as Americans. Because the craziest stories come out of the United States of America. Whether it be a woman who got bit in the hand by a bear for punching it. To the generations of fa families that like the same team. Knowing that you are a mixture of a plethora of stories, histories, and cultures. <laughs> Someone who thinks an alligator is adorable um, and makes questionable decisions during a hurricane. So there's the ideal and then there's the reality. Here in Washington, D.C., we don't even have full representation of Congress. We don't even have senators. Not all of us talk in a country accent. The irony and like, how did we all get here? I ponder that a lot. Nous avons travaillé en deux, joué en deux, et tellement les bons manger. À tout le cas, les le bon temps rouler. Being able to just go drive in any direction. One of the most American things is going on a road trip. And driving for hours without a second thought. What it means to be an Alaskan is to live wild and explore. It's being able to sleep when it's light 24 out, be awake when it's dark out. I love that midnight sun. I believe an American is someone who embraces diversity and use it to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. So for me, an American is someone who values and respects American ideals and freedoms. But the land of the free, the home of the brave, honestly. But America is nothing without New York. It's all happening here. Absurdly stubborn in your beliefs. At the end of the day, you're still going to all be friends. You're going to go out and get drinks with each other. We are the masters of making fun of each other. Being hungry like after midnight, IHOP and Denny's are always there for you. For me, it's the house of waffles. It isn't just a waffle house, it's a waffle home. The bad rep we get for calling football, soccer. This is America! An American to me is someone who likes to have a good time and someone that likes free refills. It's someone that likes very large portions at restaurants. You can use your EBT card at fast food places and wear sweats pretty much anywhere you are. <laughs> An American, you can be anything. And can turn any conversation into a competition. There's no monolithic viewpoint or perspective on what makes an American American, really. You get the whole melting pot. That's what America is. So what? Wow. That actually got to me. Is an American. This is a question I've pondered about for a long time when I was writing this script from a young age. I'm sorry I'm going down and up with the with the, the volume, but sometimes uh, the video contains an explosion and they are super loud. I want to rest my ears and yours. Age, we are taught the value of individualism. You are special. You are unique. There is no one like you in the world. And in that regard, we are also taught that it's good that we're different because then everyone has something unique and special to add. If we were all the same, then there wouldn't really be much to add or learn or grow from. It's the diversity that empowers us. We look at the world around us and see that they already know our songs and watch our TV shows and movies. Oftentimes, they imitate things that we started and put their own spin on it. We also regularly notice that on the news, people from all over the world fight to immigrate here. They see refuge and asylum it seems like they really want to join this country badly so in a sense taking all of that into account not trying to sound boastful but because of that being an american citizen is kind of like it sometimes feels like being part of some kind of weird elite club that a bunch of people want to join or at the very least give attention to and we love attention it's practically our currency it doesn't matter if it's good or bad the moment you give us your eyes and ears we win it feeds us there's nothing we hate more than just being part of the crowd every american wants to find something about themselves that makes them stick out this is why we obsess so much about things like labels and race. It's one of the easiest ways to forge an identity. We take DNA tests because at the end of the day, we all know that unless we're indigenous, we aren't native to this continent. We all come from somewhere else and sometimes we're curious. We wanna know who we are, doesn't everybody? This may sound kind of shallow on the surface, but you kind of have to understand, like all the nations of the Americas, we're kind of- I'm gonna pause right there and I say this. One thing, uh, one thing that is uh, I really love about American and uh, Americans is that they're proud of being an American. But then again, 
they do DNA tests and they research for ancestor uh, for ancestry, and they find out that they are sweet Swedish, and let's say thirty percent, and they take that heritage and make it their own, and be proud of it at the same time being proud of being an American. That's that's insane. That's that's something I always think about when I get a lot of mails. People saying that they have Swedish ancestry and how proud they are of that and how how that made them the people they are now being an American with a Swedish heritage. That's freaking gold. Kind of like the lost children of the world. We never came from royalty or nobility, no ancient legacies to honor. So in a way, we don't really have much to lose. We have to build our own empires. Of course, every American has a different story and not everyone will agree to this very sentiment, but at the very base, that's kind of what I guess it kind of somewhat feels like to be American. <sighs> Yeah. Ooh, that was a speech. In any case, let's talk about the ethnic makeup of the USA, shall we? Motion graphic time! First of all, the United States has about 340 million people and is the third most populous nation on Earth after China and India, and has the highest immigration out of any country in the world, and every nation on Earth has some kind of community or diaspora represented within it. The first and country's largest demographic being the white non-Hispanic group at about 60%, which mostly contains Caucasian Americans, typically with European origins. From there, the second largest community are Hispanic and Latino Americans, making up about 19% of the population. Keep in mind, the Latino and Hispanic communities are also incredibly diverse within themselves, and some may or may not also identify with either white or black communities, depending on where they feel on the racial scale. From there, the black community makes up the third largest demographic at somewhere around 13% of the population. After that, Asians and Pacific Islanders make up about 7% of the population, the largest communities being Chinese, Filipinos, <coughs> Indians, Vietnamese, Koreans, and Japanese. And the remaining 1% is mostly made up of Native American or Hawaiian slash Alaskan natives. Also, keep in mind some of these people listed here also register under two or more races or some other race. So in that regard, all these lines could be blurred and have asterisks applied to them depending on what the individual claims on their documents. We use the US dollar as our currency. We use the types A and B plug outlets and we drive on the right side of the road. And just like we explained in the UK episode, the USA is one of the few countries that does not use the metric system. Our units of measurements are miles, feet, inches, acres, Fahrenheit, pounds, tons, ounces, pints, quarters, and our favorite unit of measurement, the big fat ass gallon. This is a gallon. We actually measure our gas in these units too, so yeah. Also keep in mind, sometimes we don't even care. We'll just make up our own units of measurement when we're too lazy. We literally measure things like fried chicken and popcorn in buckets and ice cream in tubs. Now going back to the ethnic makeup thing. It's important to note that most multi-generational Americans today have a degree of racial and genetic admixture. Most white Americans today are descendants of immigrants that arrived through Ellis Island, not British colonials, coming from countries like Germany, Ireland, Italy, and over time, many of the whites kind of just mixed and created new American whites. It's not uncommon for them to have some Native American blood as well. And then it gets a little weird because some people are like, oh yeah, my great grandma was 184th Cherokee. No, I'm special. And the same even applies to our black population. According to a study published in the American Journal of Human Genetics, the average black person in the USA has about 24% European ancestry, but it varies by the individual. We'll talk more about the racial story of the USA no. in a bit, but first, language. Technically, the US has never declared an official language. However, the de facto national language and language of use for all administration and documents is English, or at least American English. 28 states have voted to make English the official state language of their state. Three states have de facto bilingual policies. Bilingual. They are Maine and Louisiana for French and New Mexico for Spanish. And Oh my goodness, Cajun French sounds so cool. It's like lazy swamp French. Ah bon. <laughs> no, lazy swamp French. Toi, mon chéri, essayez du gumbo et laissez le bon temps rouler. <laughs> <laughs> As for Hawaiian, well, actually, I figured maybe we should let a real Hawaiian explain. Take it away, Mr. Kamaka. Did you know that Hawaii is the only official state where English and Hawaiian serves as co-equal languages in the administration? Sometimes you can even hear Hawaiian being spoken in legislature meetings. Since the 80s, there's been a huge Hawaiian language revival because of the creation of Hawaiian immersion schools. We have schools for preschool all the way to 12th graders, and everything is done in Hawaiian. About half a century ago, Hawaiian language was at the brink of extinction with only 2,000 native speakers. Today, in 2023, 
I'm proud to say there's over 30,000 people speaking our native tongue. Thank you, Kamaka. Follow him on his social medias and his websites. He's an awesome guy doing great things for Hawaii. Otherwise, three of the territories also have official bilingual status along with English for their native languages, Spanish for Puerto Rico, Chamorro for Guam, and Samoan for American Samoa. And the Northern Mariana Islands is the only officially trilingual entity with Chamorro and Carolinian as the official Carolinian. languages alongside with English. However, as a whole, bilingualism has been growing fast in the US, mostly with Spanish and French as our most commonly taught languages in schools. In the 80s, our populace was only about 11% bilingual. Today, however, that number has more than doubled as the Census Bureau estimates that somewhere around one in five people in the US ages five and up uses another language at home, and one in four Americans are proficient enough to converse in another language. In yeah. any case, religion. In the USA, regardless of level of devotion, somewhere around 70, maybe upwards to 75% claim to be affiliated with some kind of Christian denomination, the largest ones being Protestant, followed by Catholic and non-denominational. Otherwise, the next largest religious groups are Jews and Buddhists at somewhere around 2% each and then Muslims at around 1%. For the rest of the country, it's kind of like a complicated topic because they tend to fall into a more agnostic approach in which they might claim to be spiritual but not religious. So going back to the topic, how did all the races end up here? Well, to start off, of course, the originals were the Native Americans. In a nutshell, they come from numerous tribes that each have their own customs and traditions. There are over 500... Oh, is this a map? Oh, I can't read what it says. Wow. That's a cool Seven map. Recognized ones. The Native American story of this country is an acknowledged sad one riddled in government mandated relocations, mass killings such as the one at the Battle of Wounded Knee, and broken treaties all over the place. In regard to that though, there's also a beautiful side to their story with pride and courage and tribes like the Navajo and Hopi that were honored for their code talker program in World War II. And today, some tribes like the Cherokee and Osage are starting to revive their languages to more modern <laughs> usage with things like teaching it in schools, putting their tribal scripts on street signs and businesses and windows and documents and so on. I've said this before, every American needs to visit a tribal reservation at least once and spend time learning about them. After that, whites from England started coming in from the late 1500s to the early 1600s, basically English colonialism. After that, the Atlantic slave trade from West Africa began with Portugal and eventually made its way to the United States, which is where most of our black population is derived from. A more contemporary term that some of them might use is ADOS or American descendant of slavery to distinguish themselves from blacks that immigrated from the Caribbean or Africa. Oh. Oh, that, I, didn't, I didn't know that. American descendant of slavery. So that's people that was taken from Africa. And. Yeah. Keep in mind, the United States only took in about 4% of the enslaved peoples from the Atlantic slave trade. Most of them either went to Brazil or the Caribbean when it was under the British. Eventually, the Civil War and Emancipation Proclamation happened. From there, it was still a struggle with a tense time riddled with apartheid laws and customs. Even in the North where they fought against slavery, there was still racism. There were Jim Crow laws, the bombing of Tulsa, the Rosewood. Jim Crow laws. Is that, is that the name of the law? that the restroom needs to be di divided in white and colored. Wood incident, redlining. Finally, in the 60s, the civil rights movement occurred. The 60s was kind of like the big moment. It is said that slavery and the treatment of Native Americans is the darkest chapter of American history, our biggest shame. We don't hide from it, we acknowledge it, we teach it in our schools. It's like what the Nazi thing is to Germany or the imperial thing is to Japan. For what it's worth, the story of black America is one with so many chapters, but if you look at how the story unfolds over the centuries, there is a beauty to it. Our country could not be what it is with so many amazing individuals that have revolutionized not just our country but made shockwaves throughout the whole world. Look, I'm not trying to speak on behalf of the black experience because I'm not black. I mean, I did that DNA test and it said North African, but I'm not claiming anything unless y'all approve. And if you do, I'll bring ribs and Henny to the cookout. Hey, hey, hey. But for what it's worth, <laughs> if you must take Energy. anything away from this, I think most Americans will agree that the story of America is nothing without the story of the black population. In any case, from there, we move on to the other major communities. The Chinese were the first Asians to arrive as rail line workers in the mid 1800s. Filipinos started coming in after the colonial years, then the Koreans and Vietnamese through the Korean War and the Vietnam War. For the Latino community, it's interesting. Some isolated communities of Mexicans and Spanish people were already living in certain parts of the West after lands were acquired from the Mexican-American War. However, their populations weren't really high until large migration waves came in in the 20th century. From there, Latin Americans from all over started building communities. Los Angeles has the largest Salvadoran and Guatemalan communities. Miami has Cubans, Venezuelans, Colombians. Puerto Ricans and Dominicans love New York for some reason, even though the 
the climate is nothing like their perfect, beautiful, tropical islands. I don't get that <laughs> whole thing, but whatever, you guys do you. And of course, when there's Latinos, you'll always find Mexicans somehow in the mix. There's a lot of other groups and stories behind their origins of coming here, but we just don't have time. This video is already getting long enough. If you are from a community that I didn't mention, please feel free to write about it in the comments and teach us, but otherwise we have to move on. In any case, one thing you'll notice is that our country tries really, really hard to make sure every race has some kind of representation in media or retail. For example, major store chains that sell cosmetics usually have to provide a line that comes in all shades of the skin spectrum, and most of them will have what they sometimes call ethnic hair or textured hair or coily hair sections. And fun fact, Art and I actually shop in this part of the store because uh, why Art? Marie's pomade. It's the only thing that seems to work on our hair because yeah. our hair's thick. We always use it. So yeah, we use this all the time. This is a true American classic. Yeah, not a sponsorship. We just, not a sponsorship. We just really like this stuff. Yeah. Although it could be a sponsorship. First non-black people to be a sponsor <laughs> like by Murray's. Yeah, you could use a ginger. You would oh, be oh, yeah. you would be considered the face of diversity for I them. Since the 70s, most of our TV shows and cartoons have had unspoken diversity quotas in which every cast will usually have some minority character, either main, reoccurring, or guest character. Our toy sections at stores usually contain dolls and action figures that come in all races. Nothing more iconic to this sentiment than the famous collectible American Girl dolls. Then you have the really obvious attempts like Captain Planet, Magic School Bus, and that puppet show that tried too hard. Look, even if it comes off a little forced and pandering or cringy, we try our best and usually we mean well. In any case, that was such a long-winded explanation of American social dynamics. One person who also means well and is quite dynamic would be Art. So let's switch up the subject and talk about the sports of the USA. Yes. Ah! It is Aww. I. Uh, geography now, that is the way, that's the dumbest stuff you ever did. And it's stupid, and it's, I should have known better. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hope, hopefully, uh, oh my god. Artemis, hailing from the great state of Washington. So let's get started. Can you please let's talk and not yell? to the beginning. Tribes like the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and the tribe Creek played Chunky, which involved rolling a disc and throwing a spear. Some of the Algonquin tribes played some games similar to soccer called Pasakawa Kohog, which could have had up to 500 people playing at the same time. And yes, since this is the USA episode, I'm going to just call it soccer this time. Soccer. And the most famous one that survives to this day and is actually the oldest organized sports in North America lacrosse. Fast forward to today and numerous sports have been invented in our country. We love our sports so much that we even created a sport that cheers on other sports. It's called cheerleading. Ever heard of it? Oh, and one thing, almost all schools in the USA have a mascot, which is usually a costume character to help cheer on the team. And you know you had a real American experience if your school had to change its mascot due to outdated racist undertones. Oh yeah, my school did that. And then we get the big three, baseball, basketball, and American football. Although some might say baseball was inspired by the game Rounders from England, the first official formalized version of baseball was created in New York City in 1845 and has become America's pastime sport. And basketball was created in Massachusetts. Uh, by a Canadian. Yeah, that's true. But if he wanted to make it a Canadian sport, he would have stayed in Canada. Oh, you get the. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Canada, though. <laughs> yeah, we love you. Anyway, people all over the world know our most famous player of all time. Michael Jordan, who is a multi-billionaire and never has to worry about life ever again. <laughs> He wrote that. He's set for life. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's become billionaires. <laughs> then we get to American football. We just call it football, sometimes called gridiron. It's our most popular sport. It was gridiron. Oh my God, I didn't know that. Gridiron. It's like a sport inspired from rules and techniques found in rugby and soccer. Invented by Walter Camp in the 1870s and first played by four universities. Many outside the US and Canada might not quite get the sport. So if you have to summarize it it's kind of like if you mixed war and speed chess two teams <laughs> level players they have to get to the end side okay let me just describe football really quick okay the chunky fat guys are the right paul the, the chunky the and lineman, fat the, the lineman, lineman on the front yeah. and the quarterback is trying to get the ball to whoever that can score a touchdown that's basically, that's basically it. it and it yeah. is a big deal here like a really big deal the super bowl today the usa is the most successful nation at the olympics holding nearly 3,000 medals about 1200 of which are golds we even have the most 
decorated Olympic athlete of all time, swimmer, swimmer. Michael Phelps. Swimmer, we have yeah. hosted the Olympics eight times, and soon the ninth is going to be here in Los Angeles in 2028. We will also host the 2026 FIFA World Cup, and Los Angeles will be a oh. host city as well. Otherwise, we have to bring up a bunch of other fringe sports, such as running a reindeer in Iditarod in Alaska, monster truck rallies, freestyle motocross, and of course, one of our favorite American pastimes, entertainment wrestling. Wrestling. Like WWF and WWE are staples of our American diet. There is nothing more American than WrestleMania. All the superstars. I was completely devoted to this when I was younger. Oh my days. My favorite was Undertaker. And uh, I see if I can get, get remember his name. Um, Hulk Hogan, of course. I, I think it was Bushwhack Brothers. If you can remember them, Ultimate Warrior. All right, let's give it. Let's go. All right, that's enough, Frank. Right? And cheesy guest celebrities battle it out and destroy each other. Well, destroy each other. Do they really? I mean, come on. It's so real. It's, it's so real. It's so right? real. It's so, it's real. <laughs> Those it's are so, not it's so real. For sure. <laughs> And there are loads of independent lower tier entertainment wrestling leagues in which sometimes get like really weird with like a chicken fights a wizard or a pizza chef and a green goblin or a pop tart and a mermaid. <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare actually. <laughs> and that's it for me. I'm going to get out of here. You know, guys, I am so proud to be an American. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode and I love you all. Thank you. Oh, that was a great way to end it, man. Shut up, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Art. On that note, what is the easiest way to make friends with an American? Well, you have to master the art of the American interruption. Let me explain. In other countries, it's considered rude to listen in on other people's conversations, let alone interrupt them while they're talking. But here in the USA, it's a social art form. In a way, unless we are quietly whispering something, we kind of don't mind if you hear us. And if you hear us talking about something you really understand well, and you really feel like you could contribute something to the conversation, then you are alone allowed to subtly budge your way into the conversation. For example. Wait, do you remember that Scare Factor episode where they made him bungee jump and they almost hit the yeah, water? Yeah, I remember that. Did yeah, you yeah, see yeah, that yeah, one episode? Crazy. You're gonna eat the guy. Oh my God. Oh, what? You remember when they blended up the centipedes? And it was yeah, like, oh, oh my God. God. We're American best friends. Keep in mind, this can go both ways for shared interests and shared hatred. Yo, did you hear that new Blake album? No, he's not as good as he used to be. No, he, pre-2017 Blake was ragged. Like, no, he's just been crying. Do you guys remember that, that music video with the girl in like the orange dress? Like, what was yeah, she doing? Yeah, what was that all about? We're American best friends. And look, to my fellow Americans, I know some of you guys have been through some rough patches in the way how you see yourselves in our country. But let me just remind you a few things. Our country has gone through a lot of crazy things, a lot of shameful things in the past, but we also have a lot of glory and a lot of accomplishments. It's your country just as much as it is mine, and you're my family, and we get to share in the glory of this country. 21 elements on the periodic table were discovered or co-discovered by us, and five of them are named after places in our country. I see Sweden a lot over there, it was kind of cool. Country. We absolutely lead the world in space exploration. We're the only people that have landed on the moon and we did it six times and played golf on it. We sent the first satellite images of other planets like Jupiter, Saturn, and even Pluto. And we were the first to land a rover on Mars. We pioneered the genome project and pioneered so many medical advancements. We donate more money for charity and aid for people in need across the world than all the other countries combined. We have the number one film industry in the world. We invented so many things. I'm not even going to get into it and name them all, but one of them being personal computers and the internet and YouTube, which you would need to watch this video. And that's just a small fraction of the heritage that your nation gets to claim. And you and I are a part of it. So Buck up, kiddo. No matter how much we fight, we're still family in the end, and we're all kind of pretty awesome. And I guess that's who we are as Americans. We're just the lost children of the world that made our own thing. And that's our heritage. And to talk more about how that heritage is subdivided regionally, here's Hannah with the culture segment. Hello, everyone. We are at the America episode, and you know I have to start it out with a big roll tide, because you know I am from... Alabama, the Indian, and the baby. Actually, the baby is not from Alabama. It's from California. Oh, you're gonna have a California baby. Oh no. <laughs> so when I say American culture, lots of things probably pop into your head. Surfing and skateboarding, catch up, ranch dressing, pickup trucks, cowboys, pop and locking, shopping scooters, shopping scooters, yellow school buses, drinks with ice, 64 ounce cups, red solo cups, spray cans of cheese, root beer, to-go bag, carpet floors, wearing shoes indoors, and so on. These are all fun and true to 
to some extent, but there's a deeper story behind our people. For one, culture in the USA is typically divided into five main regions within the lower 48 and micro regions within them. So let's start off. Northeasterners are hustling business folk. It is home to the Bosch Wash Corridor, the largest megalopolis in the world in terms of economic output, with about one-sixth of the entire country's population. People here live in or have close access to large metropolitan all right, so Boston, Boston, New York City, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. Which most likely means they are acquainted with a wide range of ideas, opportunities, office buildings, and the daily grind of modern life. Funny enough, Pennsylvania is also home to the largest Man Amish right. community that chooses to avoid modern technology. The Midwest, or the Great Lakes region, is the industrial and manufacturing belt. The lakes and rivers help them prosper and trade historically. Detroit is known for its car industry, hence the nickname Motown or Motor City. Chicago processes food and machinery. Wisconsin is the dairy capital. In fact, two of the top three best hospitals in the country and in the world are here. Yeah. Overall, the Midwest is good at making things, and they are famous for having some of the funniest accents and nicest people in the country. Oh, don't you know? Then we get to the Great Plains and the frontier. This is the breadbasket and mountains of the nation. Basically, this is the resource epicenter. After these lands were acquired, the U.S. government encouraged westward expansion to the citizens by implementing the Homestead Act in 1862. So basically, this became the Wild West if you've seen the classy, kitschy Americana Western films. This area also has the most Native American reservations as well. Be respectful to the tribes if you ever enter the land, as they have their own autonomous set of rules that may differ from the state they are in. Colorado is known for having the healthiest people in the country. Wyoming is one of the few places where you can still see authentic cowboys and cowgirls. Utah and Idaho have the heaviest concentration of the Mormon community. Arizona and New Mexico have a desert culture. They know how to handle heat and and thrive in it. Then there's the West Coast, California, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. Basically, two things dominate this region. Entertainment, which is literally what we're doing right now on the West Coast, uh -huh. and tech innovation. Everyone knows Los Angeles is the entertainment capital of the world, home to Hollywood, where the largest and busiest studios and production facilities in the world operate. Up north, you start getting tech hubs like Silicon Valley and Seattle, the startup and innovation centers with companies like Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and and so on. Wow, there's so much information. Everyone knows Vegas in Nevada, the largest casino state. However, not everything is neon lights and robotics. Oregon is where the whole lumber industry pretty much started. And today, some of the best alpine forests are found here. So you find more naturey people out in those parts. And finally, we reach the South, my home region, the region everyone in the US is moving to right now. This is probably the most well-known distinct region of the USA. Most people, whether religious or not, have had some kind of affiliation with the church growing up and will find themselves praying, even if they are on a reality show intended to showcase their drunken sexual escapades. And that's also because everyone knows the South is the best party place in the country. But tangent, because a lot of our colleges have the best football teams, reasons to celebrate. Reasons to celebrate. Louisiana is our best kept secret. They have the unique Cajun and Creole culture that dominates everything. There's nothing like Mardi Gras on Bourbon Street, but if you want the the original and real Mardi Gras, you have to go to Mobile, Alabama. And as much as I hate to admit it, the entire state of Florida is kind of a non-stop party. Even hurricanes don't stop them. Everyone knows the strangest and craziest things happen in Florida. I think it's because it's so hot and humid there. South Florida is home to Miami, which is basically North Cuba. It has a unique Caribbean culture. Literally, you need to speak Spanish. The Mississippi Delta is where so many famous people like Elvis Presley and Oprah were born. You have the Appalachian or Piedmont, Piedmont South where banjo and bluegrass music began and where some of the best moonshine is made. Along the coasts of North and South Carolina and Georgia you have the unique Gola community, descendants of the freed slaves that inhabit the barrier islands. They are known for speaking their own unique Creole that has West African influence, Whoa. musical performances, and sweetgrass woven crafts. Then of course we get to Texas, the big guy. Let's just say Texas is not just a cowboy state, it's evolving into a 
major modern tech and entrepreneur hub. They're tough, they're proud, and they love their state. In Alaska, you can actually find bush communities that live mostly off the grid and survive in the elements and prefer bartering instead of using money. Native Hawaiians invented surfing and they were ocean navigation experts traversing the entire Pacific on canoes. Micronesians in Guam and the Marianas also have their distinct Chamorro culture and they live by the concepts of emote and menyaina. American Samoans are obviously the cousins of the Samoans. They have their unique matai and chiefdom systems of ruling themselves and the fa'a Samoa or Samoan way of life. The Virgin Islands uh -oh. is like a mini Jamaica. They have their own Creole English, Quell Bay or scratch bands, amazing seafood and the unique oh, wow. Maui drink made of tree bark. Puerto Ricans are kind of like the US's favorite Latinos. Politics aside, they have created so many cultural impacts that have crept onto the mainland, especially in places like New York and Florida. Home of bombo, reggaeton, everyone knows Robert Clemente, Ricky Martin, J-Lo, Daddy Yankee, and Luis Fonzi. So that's the quick condensed overview of the US's regional cultures. There is so much more we could have mentioned, but it would take forever. If you are from a region yeah. of the USA with a distinct cultural trait we missed, write it in the comments and tell Teach us. I guess with all of that, we go back to the crazy Florida region because now it is Florida Man Keith's time to talk to us about the music. Take it away, crazy Florida Man. Woo! That's the America there episode. Okay. All right, we're in Florida. Hey, Jeez. what's Yeah, made it to Florida. Yeah. Ooh, There's back. even a fight going on outside, so that's how you know it's real Florida. Hey, what's up, everybody? What's up? Name Keith. Woo! Thanks for having me on the show, Paul. I'm not trying to sound cocky or anything like that. Every other country on the face of the earth deserves its own spotlight. With all that being said, we're the number one music market in the entire world. We export more music and entertainment to the rest of the world than any other country ever. Look, but first, let's take it back, way back, to the indigenous people of the United States. Native Americans are known for their powwow events of, you know, war drums and dancing and singing and all kinds of really great traditions. Traditional seen this guy before the Hawaiians who have the luau's and it's pretty amazing too and they got the fire spinning and the Inuits have their traditional throat singing that they perform <laughs> So the largest Native American powwow event in the United States is called the Gathering of the Nations. And you can go check out this event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it's performed oh, wow. every April. And I highly recommend you guys go and check it out. In Hawaii, you have also the Merry Monarch Festival. It's like oh, the most God. Hawaiian thing you can possibly see with your own two eyes. Unless if you have one eye, then you uh, it's the most amazing thing with your one eye. Now let's fast forward. American music really started to gain its international recognition in the 1800s with things like vaudeville and acapellas. Like the Fisk Jubilee singers who broke barriers and received the National Medal of Arts. Prior to the 20th century, American music was either classical parlor music slash saloon music. All Americans know such songs like Home on the Range and Oh Susanna by Stephen Foster. And then something crazy happened. Jazz. Oh my God, jazz. Woo! There is nothing more American than jazz music, a very highly intellectual form of music. Jazz basically changed the entire world in, or helped shape today's modern music. I mean, you can take, you know, the chord structures, like complex chord structures. I mean, songs like Giant Steps, you literally have every other beat where it changes like a chord to odd time signatures. I mean, Take Five was like a very popular jazz standard that was in by this record, uh, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. Miles Davis set the standard of how good jazz can sound in my opinion but let's be real I mean you also had John Coltrane in his band I mean even at points I mean Bill Evans was on his record today's music wouldn't be anything without jazz I mean I also want to highlight blues music just as much as jazz because without blues as well we wouldn't have had the era of rock and roll people like Howlin' Wolf BB King Stevie Ray Vaughan Gary Clark Jr you know without blues we would have never gotten into eventually having Elvis Presley to the beyond into the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and everybody's favorite bands at one point it, it all kind of stems from the blues we can't leave out what was going on in New York City with hip-hop culture so basically it all started with a guy named DJ cool hurt it took off from there wow. we have Detroit for Motown and how can we forget about Nashville Nashville the main thing that people see is country music but you can just as much go to indie show and go check out some indie hipster band or go go check out 
check out a metal band. Believe it or not, Nashville has the highest musicians per capita in the entire world. Texas was the birthplace of Tijano. Every Amer Mexican American knows uh, Selena and probably has some sort of private room in their closet uh, with a shrine dedicated to Selena. With all that being said, so many of our American artists have gained international recognition and fan base. You can be in the middle of the Himalayas going camelback and come upon a salt mine and some dude is going to be all like, dude, have you ever checked out the Thriller record from Michael Jackson? And then he's going to, you're going to be like, yeah, who doesn't know Michael Jackson? Yeah, bro. Oh, there's a thriller. I'm sure this part is going to get flagged and taken down. Anyways, I love all of you. Thanks so much for uh, having me on the America episode. My name's Keith. Good job, Keith. Yes, America. Thank you, Keith, the real original Florida man. Okay, so yeah, I'm not even gonna try and end this segment with something witty. This episode is already the longest we've ever had on the channel, so let's just jump into the final segment, shall we? The friend zone. <laughs> When it comes to our diplomacy and foreign policy, the USA is quite the extrovert. And even if there's a diplomatic strain or limited interaction in one area of the world, we still have some degree of connection thanks to our incredibly diverse population and diaspora communities. I literally found people from places like South Sudan, the Solomon Islands, and even our rarest guest, Carrie, from Tuvalu here in the United States. That's how insanely diverse and interconnected our nation is. In any case, the motion graphic. As a member of numerous IGOs in Asia, the USA works closely with many members and has deep ties to them. For example, after World War II and the Korean War, the US has invested heavily in Japan and South Korea, and today they are the only two East Asian countries with visa-free access to the US. The Philippines is super close too, as they were once a US colony. Sorry. They speak English, and many American cultural traits have adopted into Filipino society. India shares a close relationship, as they make the second largest Asian diaspora community in the US after the Chinese. They have huge bilateral trade deals and joint military exercises. They are easy to engage with as an Anglophone nation nation and heads of state have met numerous times. With China, it's almost always a complicated, extensive, economic-based relationship. And of course, there's the whole Taiwan thing. Basically, in the 70s, former President Richard Nixon visited, and soon after, the U.S.-China joint communique and the six assurances were established. Long story short, no matter how things get, we keep doing this thing where it's like, I think I'm better than you, but I want to keep dancing with you. Otherwise, as a member of various North and South American organizations, the U.S. has very obvious and close ties to their North and South American neighbors. In the broadest sense, they are all kind of like new world countries that share a similar story of being built off of European colonialism, evolving into the vibrant new societies that they are today. The US was the first country to recognize Brazil as a nation in 1808, and many sociologists oh. will say that Brazil is kind of like the closest country resembling the US in shared experiences related to their demographic makeup. The only real major difference is that Brazil was more Catholic influenced, whereas the US was more Protestant. Otherwise, moving on to Africa, the US cooperates in many discussions with the AU and ADB. The African Growth and Opportunity Act in 2000 provides preferential cooperation to the U.S. market for eligible African countries such as Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. And today many African Americans do pilgrimage trips and some even get dual citizenship. Oh yeah, and Liberia was like the U.S.'s long lost adoptive African stepchild that we keep forgetting. We really need to pay more attention to them and give them more love. When it comes to Europe though, basically the U.S. has always had some kind of constant interaction with Europe since the inception of our nation's independence. France was the first country to establish diplomatic relations with us. Also, thank you for giving us the Statue of Liberty. Over the years, Europeans from virtually every corner of the continent immigrated to the U.S. and built communities and neighborhoods. After World War II, we signed the Marshall Plan, which was a huge economic recovery act, which eventually evolved into the formation of NATO. The only main European relationship that has a roller coaster of diplomatic instability typically lands with Russia, rooted in the Cold War era conflict, but this is a topic for another time. When it comes to our best friends, yeah. however, typically American Americans will probably root for one of the teen major Anglophone nations. We Americans hardcore crush on the Aussies and Kiwis. I personally feel like nothing illustrates this more than the Irwin family. We share a history of being former British colonies. We are members of ANZUS, the Pacific Committee, and a partner in the Pacific Islands Forum. We share very common political and cultural interests. We've almost always teamed up and had each other's backs on numerous international conflicts. And yeah, overall we love them. Then we hit a little closer to home and get to Canada and the UK. Canada is more 
more like our obedient little brother that stuck with Daddy Britain as we broke away and got our own apartment. Later on, they saw us having so much fun and then kind of slowly and politely requested to leave Dad's nest. Nonetheless, in a technical sense, Canada has the oldest shared relationship with us as we were both being formed at the same time. So we ultimately really get each other and we share so much in common in regards to culture, values, and politics. We both speak English, much to the chagrin of the Quebecois. About 75 to 85 percent of their trade goes through the USA. Granted, sometimes Canadians hope they don't get too Americanized and they try to salvage their Canadian identity, whatever that means. But ultimately, we love them. We marry the crap out of each other. We hire their musicians and actors. They let us film in Vancouver for super cheap. And we love how they hate it when we call them our 51st state. Finally, we end no. up with the old man, UK. The US is the rebel son that broke away, yet after things cooled off, we totally laughed about it and became the closest friends all over again. Today, the two countries share the world's largest direct foreign investment partnership and virtually go hand in hand in almost every international issue. The UK is like our connection to Europe, and recently both countries have affirmed the other as being the country with the most important bilateral partnership in their foreign policy. Long story short, the story ends right where it began. The USA and UK will always look out for each other. All right, the motion graphic is over. It's time to do this. In conclusion, look, personally, if you're American, you're my family. We don't always have to agree on everything. In fact, we might not even like each other. We might even kind of hate each other a little bit. But the point is, if you're an American, you're still my family. And at the end of the day, my family comes first. I'll still have your back. Nobody messes with my crazy family. And if you have a green card, it's like you're kind of engaged to my family and I can't wait for the wedding. If you're undocumented and you call this country your home and you love it and you work hard and you have good character and want to be a part of the family, then I'm rooting for you to take all the necessary steps to join the family. And for those of you saying that we have problems, yeah, of course we have problems. We always have problems. We always will. But look at our history. When there was a problem, we didn't stick with it grumbling and twiddling our thumbs. We openly acknowledged it. We erupted a little bit. We let things get messy. And then <laughs> we figured things out. That's kind of how we do things. We're Americans. We're still figuring things out. And we're not even 300 years old. We're just getting started. We're not done. We're never done. We don't stop. You're part of a people and nation that has done amazing things that the world has never seen before. You're part of that amazingness. It's like by default, you Americans are already unique. You're already amazing. You just you might not recognize it or feel it, but you are. We became our our own royals and this is our home and I love you all oh oh shoot um yeah uh Uruguay stay tuned Uruguay is coming up next sorry you have to follow that uh <clears throat> that's a lot of rambling towards Americans I understand there's a situation going on but there's a situation going on everywhere not limited to the United States I really did enjoy this episode it was way too long to my uh to my liking because there's too much information coming uh, and I can see my Maya is sleeping right there. Uh, I did enjoy this. Without a doubt, if you did too, smack the like. And of course, hit that subscribe. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I'm Ricky. You stay safe.